Hey everyone, Houston Math Prep here. When we start out in algebra and we first learn about circles, we learn something like x squared plus y squared equals 1. We learn that that's a circle with radius 1 centered at the origin. Later on, we learn that we call that the unit circle in trigonometry. And we figure out ways to express that in terms of what we call the circular trigonometric functions in terms of sine and cosine. If you think about either from trig or pre-calculus, uh, we look at what we call parametric equations and we say, well, the x value on the unit circle is whatever cosine of the angle is and the y value on the unit circle is whatever the sine of the angle is. And we let it go from 0 to 2 pi because the idea is that then takes us exactly one trip around the unit circle if we let the angle vary from 0 to 2 pi. We then look at graphing functions in trigonometry like y equals sine x, and the idea is if the y value changes as we let the angle change, then if I move in a trajectory around the unit circle, my vertical value for the function should change as my angle changes. So as I move counterclockwise, you can see our height of the sine x graph moves exactly as the height of our angle moves around the unit circle. And so we get this graph of y equals sine x. We have a similar thing going on with the graph of y equals cosine x, except the height of that function actually changes as our x-coordinate on the unit circle changes. So as we move to the right on the unit circle, the graph goes up. As we move to the left on the unit circle, the graph of y equals cosine x goes down. Both of these are wave-like functions, and they're called circular functions based on the unit circle. We have lots of other circular functions that are based on sine and cosine. We have the tangent of something, which is the sine of that something divided by the cosine of that something. We have the cotangent, which is the reciprocal of that, the cosine divided by the sine of that thing. And then we have the reciprocal functions. We have secant of x, which is the reciprocal of the cosine function, and we have cosecant, which is the reciprocal of the sine function. So the question in our video today is, why the unit circle? Why couldn't I use something like the unit hyperbola, which I have here. So instead of x squared plus y squared equals 1, we have x squared minus y squared equals 1, our unit hyperbola. Could we do a similar thing where we base some version of sine and cosine not on the unit circle, but on the unit hyperbola instead? The nice thing about our unit circle was that it was all one piece, one connected graph. You'll notice our unit hyperbola here is actually two separate branches of a graph. So if we want to do this and not have to somehow hop over to the other branch to draw the graph, what we'll do is just restrict ourselves to looking at one side, say in quadrants 1 and 4 of this graph. And if we look at just one branch, could we define the same way that we do for the unit circle some sine and cosine values that are based on this hyperbola instead? The idea being we just write parametric equations for the unit hyperbola so that x is defined as the hyperbolic cosine of the angle and y is defined as the hyperbolic sine of the angle. Now because this is not a graph that repeats, right, as we go around the unit circle, we get a repeating graph. We get that the graphs are periodic. This is just simply one curve that will go on forever. It will start you know, infinitely far down in the direction of quadrant four, and it will come up as we travel it, and then we will go infinitely out in the direction of quadrant one. So we are actually going to change our domain for t to be all real numbers so that we get the entire branch of our unit hyperbola here. If we define parametric equations this way, then the path that we trace out will be all of the x and y values for these functions, hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. So here we are traveling this path, this trajectory that's our parametric equations of the hyperbolic cosine being the x value and the hyperbolic sine being the y value. The same way that we graph a circular function like y equals sine x, we can graph y equals hyperbolic sine of x. We simply look at traveling the unit hyperbola as a trajectory, and because sine is synonymous with the y value, I will plot all of the y values that I get as I travel that hyperbolic path. 
That gives us a graph for the hyperbolic sine function that looks like this. For shorthand, especially in North America, you will hear this sometimes pronounced as cinch. So you may read this equation as y equals cinch of x instead of hyperbolic sine. We can think about graphing y equals the hyperbolic cosine of x graph in the same way. As we travel the unit hyperbola, we think about how do the x values change as we move along it. They are positive, they decrease to 1, and then they increase again after that. This gives us the hyperbolic cosine graph. Hyperbolic cosine uh, in North America can often be pronounced as cosh, just sort of as it looks. So you may, instead of calling this y equals hyperbolic cosine of x, call this y equals cosh x. If we look more closely at hyperbolic functions, we'll also note that they are related to exponential functions. If I look first at the hyperbolic cosine function, or the cosh function, here I have exponential growth, y equals e to the x, and I have the graph of exponential decay, y equals e to the negative x. If I graph cosh on top of the same set of axes as these, I will notice that the y value for cosh is always halfway between the exponential growth and the exponential decay functions. In other words, it is the average of those two functions. So we get a definition for cosh, hyperbolic cosine of x, being the average of these two things. So I add exponential growth and exponential decay, and I divide them by 2. And this is our exponential definition for hyperbolic cosine of x, for cosh of x. Similarly, looking at hyperbolic sine, or the cinch function, if I graph exponential growth e to the x, and actually the opposite sign of exponential decay, negative e to the negative x, and then I graph cinch on the same set of axes with these, we will notice that I am halfway between these two functions. So the cinch function, cinch of x, is the average of these. In other words, hyperbolic sine of some number is equal to the average of exponential growth and negative exponential decay, e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2. Just like with the circular functions from trigonometry, where tangent is the sine of something over the cosine of that thing, etc., we also have other hyperbolic functions that are based on hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. So for example, hyperbolic tangent is equal to cinch of x over cosh of x. Hyperbolic cotangent of x is equal to the cosh of x over cinch of x. Hyperbolic secant and hyperbolic cosecant are likewise the reciprocals of cosh x and cinch x. These functions are used all over advanced mathematics. They are involved in solutions in mechanics problems with wave equations. The hyperbolic cosine functions, in particular, are used with hanging cables, chains, building bridges so that they do not sway under stress. Cosh functions can also be found in what are called catenaries a particular type of arch in architecture. Hyperbolic tangent functions you can find in conversions when doing Mercator projections with maps of the globe, and hyperbolic secant functions are used in finding pursuit curves, in the way that tractors drag their trailers, or in the way that a dog may chase its owner or prey. Check out some more of our hyperbolic videos. We'll see you next time.